At 28 years old, I was shot and paralyzed from the chest down. I had two options. I could stop and let the things I cannot control control me, or I could move forward and put my energy into things that would improve my life and those around me. I chose to move forward and surround myself with risk takers, innovators, and leaders who've chosen the same path. Join us on the journey. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Forward with me, Derek Herrera, and my guest today, Jake Harriman. Jake is a truly inspirational character. He is a former Marine Infantry and Reconnaissance Officer, a nonprofit leader, an entrepreneur, and is working now to create change for all of us. He served as a Marine Infantry and Reconnaissance Officer, deploying to places like Iraq in the early 2000s. And while he was there in Iraq, he was inspired to create change because what he saw on the battlefield was that the people we were fighting often had no other choice due to the extreme poverty and the situation that they were encountering. And so he set on a mission to change that and pursue the goal of, of ending or eradicating extreme poverty across the world so that these people wouldn't be, uh, felt like they had no other option than to pick up weapons and to fight. So that was the genesis for his nonprofit organization called Nuru International, N-U-R-U International. And as he left the military, and he was working to develop this 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 plan to to, to change the world. He drove a seafood truck uh, until he was able to to gain admittance to Stanford uh, GSB, the business school there, to develop this plan and build this nonprofit organization. And so once he graduated from Stanford, pursued this full time and spent almost a decade uh, developing the situation and delivering results in places like Kenya. Ethiopia and places in in Africa. After this, he came back to the U.S. and was dismayed by what he saw with partisanship and a lot of the divide between people in America and set on a new mission to change that with his new organization called More Perfect Union. You can learn more about More Perfect Union at MPU, More Perfect Union, M, the letters M-P-U dot U-S. And his mission with More Perfect Union is to try to help bring people together, specifically leveraging the network of veterans and special operators that he knows and is able to rally behind this cause to try to save America. And so truly incredible conversation I was able to have with Jake and hope you all enjoy it. Again, if you're interested in learning more about how Jake is working to create lasting change in what is a clearly defunct and broken political system here in the United States, visit More Perfect Union at mpu.us. I hope you enjoy this episode of Forward with me, Derek Rare, and my friend, Jay Carryman. And if you do, please consider liking, commenting, sharing, uh, subscribing, and or leaving us a rating if you're on Apple Podcasts. Uh, every rating that we get and the comments that we get help provide feedback that we can use to make the show better and also expand our reach to people who may not be aware of the mission that we're on with the hope that we can help influence others and help bring them to this movement uh, of resilience and moving forward beyond adversity. So hope you all enjoy this episode and have a great week. Welcome to the show, Jake. Thanks, brother. Good to be here. The pleasure's all mine. Uh, it's great, great to catch up with you. Really looking forward to having a chat with you and learning more about what you're doing now. Um, to start off, you served as a Marine infantry and, and special operations officer would love to learn a little bit about just the reasons why you decided to get involved and, and serve your country uh, and join the military. Yeah, my dad, when I was, when I was young, my dad was in the, uh, he'd been in the Navy during Vietnam. Uh, he was a guy on the USS Midway. Uh, he did a four year tour. He didn't talk about it a whole lot, but it was clear it was a pretty major part of his life. And I remember, you know, every 4th of July, I don't know if you, uh, you're probably too young to remember this, but they used to have like parades every, every 4th of July. And we had this little black and white TV that we'd get around and kind of watch parades every, every 4th. And my dad would always like tear up, you know, when we were watching the parades and, and, uh, it was hard for, I mean, I was always like, I was as a kid, my dad never cried. I, I thought there's something in his eye, like what's going on here. But over time I began to realize, you know, my dad had really close friends of his who were Marines in Vietnam who'd lost their lives. And, he, he understood 
the cost of freedom. And he understood what it took to really defend our democracy and allow us all to have the kind of freedoms that we enjoy every single day. And while he never really talked much about it, I had this kind of burden of, of I needed to serve. You know, I, need to, I, I needed to, to spend at least part of my life uh, supporting and defending the freedoms that we, that we have, have a right to have here in this country. And so that, that really called me kind of at a young age. I, I really felt like I needed to get involved and be, be in, in, the, uh, in the ranks of those who serve our country overseas and risk their lives at times to defend what we all enjoy. It's awesome. And so that's how you ended up at the, the boat school, right? Well, it's funny, man, because I originally, some miracle, I got in the boat school when I was um, in high school and I turned it down because they told me I had to wear a tie and I had to be in the military for six years. And I, I was like, no way, man, that's not for me. So I, I, and all my buddies were going, I never been anywhere, man. I was, we were poor growing up. I literally never traveled outside the state of West Virginia. And I remember all my buddies were going to West Virginia University to party. And I thought, you know, when you're in high school, you think that your buddies are going to be your buddies for the rest of your life. And so I wanted to follow them to, to Morgantown, West Virginia. And when I went there, I kind of instantly realized I made a big mistake. Uh, I really wanted to see the world. I wanted to kind of travel. I wanted to, again, I felt this call to serve, this kind of burden of service. And so uh, after the first year at WVU, I applied to get back in Navy. And it was kind of a brutal reapplication process. But after a while, they finally let me back in. And so that, that at that point, then I went, I went to the Naval Academy. I still had to do four years. You know, they don't take any transfers, right? So you kind of got to start over um, as, a, as a plebe, as a freshman, to get beat up a little bit. But, um, but yeah, I was, uh, they let me back in. Uh, funny story. I originally, when I was there, I, I, didn't, I didn't know anything about the military going in. I heard the, Na- the Navy was great for sports and, and that uh, a bunch of good people there. You get to travel, that kind of stuff. The, the, I, I, but I knew nothing about what I was getting into. I'd seen Top Gun, thought I was going to be a Navy pilot, and uh, I got there, and my eyes weren't good enough. I, I got like 20, 30, or 20, 40 vision or something like that, and so uh, I started looking around what else I could do, and I um, saw the, the SEALs, and the SEALs were out there you know, on campus, and they were training, and I had a couple of SEAL officers there. And they were real visible, and so I thought, well, I'd, you know, I, I I want to do SEAL. So we, I worked really, really hard, and um, I think we had 15 spots in my class. We had about 400 people that were kind of going for those slots. And I remember my senior year, I went home for Thanksgiving, thinking I had one of the spots because there were 20 of us left, and I thought for sure I was going to be one of the last guys to make the cut. And they called us all of us over Thanksgiving break. To let us know yes or no, and and uh, I got cut in the last last five, and it's one of the best lessons I ever had in my life about humility, you know, because up to that point, I had never failed at anything, I, you know, I always excelled at what I, you know, kind of been at the top of the class or the top of the pack or whatever it might be. I was just crushed, man. Uh, my ego was crushed. My everything was crushed, and. Um, my second pick had been Marine Corps ground. And I didn't know at the time, I didn't know anything about force recon. I, you know, there, there was a, there actually was a, a, a force officer on campus, but he never talked about it. You know how it is like now, same thing with Raiders. Like the, the, the guys don't talk about it, right? It's not <laughs> kind of not the same thing as the SEALs. I didn't know anything about it. I, I just knew that uh, the Marines were pretty kick-ass guys on campus there. And and that Marine Ground, I thought, would be a great, a great option. So I, I put that, I had put that as my second pick, and thankfully I got it. And um, then when I became, you know, I went to, graduated, went to the basic school and found a really cool tribe to be a part of there and, and got selected for infantry and went to IOC. And then I started learning more about this kind of path, you know, that you could, you know, to force recon and kind of all you know, learning how to be a part of that community. And there was, at the time, you just, there was nothing, there wasn't a lot out there about it. They didn't talk about it. And there was no like recruiting for it and, you know, that kind of stuff. It's kind of like they call you, don't call them kind of thing. But I remember I got, you know, I got stationed at Camp Pendleton at 3-1, at three and which was awesome. That was such an amazing unit. But I remember I was so anxious and, ex- and excited and eager to try to go to force 
um, I was a boot sec lieutenant, showed up at, at Camp Pendleton. I was there for probably, I don't know, six weeks or something. And I heard just through the grapevine that Force was running a selection um, that they did, you know, every, periodically. I can't remember how, how often it was that they ran a selection, but there was a selection they were going to run. And it was at, you know, 4 a.m. You go, here's the gear list. I had somehow got the gear list and all that kind of stuff. Well, you don't just like sh- show up for, you know, selection, right? You got to, you got to get orders and all that kind of stuff. Well, I just thought I was just going to kind of like weasel my way in. I would pass selection. They wouldn't know. And then they kind of have to take me. That was my strategy. It was so stupid. So I remember like going over there. This was my second really big humbling experience. So I, I went over there, showed up at 4 a.m. Everybody's like, you know, kind of getting ready. It's super dark. Nobody's checking any lists or anything. So I show up in my, with my 50 pound rucksack and kind of get ready to go. And, and I start through the selection and, and I get about halfway through in the pool phase and I'm in the pool and I'm basically drowning. I mean, I'm just like, I'm suffering at this point. I got, it's halfway through the day. I want to die, but I'm like, like, I can't quit. Right. So about halfway, I'm like, struggling to get across the pool in one of the in one of the water aerobics and I remember the captain who was running the selection say hey who's the, who the hell's that guy and you know the the a instructor's like I don't know sir and so they, they yanked me out of the pool he said who who are you I say sir I'm a second lieutenant here he's like second lieutenant I said what are, what are you doing here I said hey sir I just you know I, I just want to come take selection I'm join forces like Listen, son, he said, why don't you go back over to 3-1? Once you get some hair on your balls, you can come back over here and you can, you can play with us a little bit more. I, it was an utter failure. I, I got punished that day. But it was a great lesson, you know, that, uh, you know, and again, in humility. You know, I, I feel like I've always had to learn humility the hard way um, time after time again. But that was kind of my first introduction to the force community. That's awesome. So I didn't realize we had that in common, but we both had similar experiences with, oh. uh, not, not with showing up to selection, but with the Naval Academy. So, uh, okay. same thing. I grew up watching Navy SEALs, wanted to be a Navy SEAL, uh, yeah. worked hard, right. And made it to the last part in the interviews. And I bombed the interview. Like I said, the worst, the dumb, it, like I was <laughs> like, I couldn't have done worse. Right. Like, uh, <laughs> the worst possible thing. And, uh, and I bombed it and didn't get it right now. I was devastated. Like I, cr- I was crushed. Right. And then yeah, I was really yeah. fortunate because at that time there were like 400 people who put the Marine Corps as their first choice. And there's like 200 mm. slots and I had it as my third oh my choice. Gosh. Uh, and I didn't get my second choice either, which was EOD at the time, Navy EOD. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, mm. You know, and I'm like, whatever. All right, I'm not going to get this. But I had a mentor who, who intervened on my behalf and was basically like, Hey, if you're serious about this, I think you would be a good Marine officer. I think you could have potential, but you know, I'm not going to go in there and stick my neck out for you unless you, you know, you're willing to commit a hundred percent to this line of work and this profession. And hmm. I said, let's do it. And I'm in. And I was so fortunate that he, he sent me on that path. Um, and then obviously fortunate to learn. I learned about recon and force recon in a different way. Um, I didn't just show up, but I kept, I kept asking, right? Like I was asking around and kind of like, you know, yeah. learning more about it and things. And, um, and I asked my battalion commander, uh, after my first deployment, I was like, Hey, you know, sir, you were, you know, he was a Naval Academy grad. He had gone to first force as a first Lieutenant or not first force. He'd gone to second force as a first Lieutenant, which was unique. Right. Hmm. Um, yeah. 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 I'm like, Hey, sir, like, let me go on the end doc. You know, I just performed well on deployment. Like just want to go to the end doc. Right? Yeah. like, yeah, I think you're going to recon. No. There's no chance you're going to be, you don't even know what's good for you. You, you need to be a company XO. You're going to be an XO. And I was like, <laughs> Roger that, sir. Right. And unfortunately for me, I was able at that yeah. point, the selection process for MARSOC was kind of outside of the process. I was like, okay, well at least let me go take assessment and selection. They won't let me go. I'll be the XO for the deployment. Yeah. You know, I have to do two deployments before I can transfer. Mm-hmm. And, um, so anyway, so that was how I ended up figuring that out, but it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I learned so much stuff too. I mean, I, thank God I was able to, to, to be in the infantry. Right. I mean, I learned so many, so many great lessons when I was in the infantry from my Marines. Right. I mean, it was just unbelievable how much they uh, taught me and, 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 and the lessons that I, that I used when I went over to, when I eventually did make it over to force. Uh, it was, 
I was in a much more kind of seasoned, like, like you said, I needed that experience. I needed that time with my Marines under my belt so I could really even understand. Because once I got over to force, you know, I had team leaders who had like 17, 18 years of experience in the recon community. And here I was, I mean, I was still felt like a super boot at like four years, you know, four, four, four or five year captain, or, you know, and didn't know my ass from my elbow, you know, when it came time, it came to, you know, kind of uh, the type of mission sets we were going to be working on. And uh, it actually taught me a lot. The the humility that I learned early on really helped sure. me when I got to the force community. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and, and it's really unique. And, and a lot of people ask me now, they say like, you know, how does the infantry time compare to the time in the Marine Raiders or special operations community and which one's better, right? And I don't say either one's better, right? Because at that time, that was exactly what I needed. And I have so many phenomenal memories and had such a phenomenal experience that's unique, leading an infantry platoon and being a company XO. And those are memories that, you know, mm -hmm. are on par and equal with my time in the Raider community, right? Even though the Raider community was different and enjoyable in different means. It was Absolutely. Just, yeah. So you get over to force. And what was the timing like for for your deployments and things like obviously it was right around September 11th and how did that play out for you? Yeah. So I did, um, I did a couple, uh, deployments with three, one, uh, first, and actually I became a company XO too. So I was a platoon commander first nice. and then I was a, uh, became a weapons company XO, uh, after that. So I did, I did a tour. The first one was kind of a normal MUSOC tour, did that deployment with the, with the coal. And then, then nine 11 happened. Then we went to, uh, to Djibouti, we were helping build out Camp Lemonair there and looking at some some counterterrorism stuff across the Gulf of Aden. And um, we did a lot of stuff, uh, that deployment, not, not, nothing like high intensity at all, you know? So we, we, I still hadn't seen, you know, a lot of any kind of real combat or anything until uh, we went back and we were the senior battalion of the Marine Corps when we got back. And we all thought we were, you know how it is when you get home from USAC, everybody kind of goes their separate ways. Some of the Marines get out, you get refitted from SOI, et cetera. And you, but you got this long kind of leave period, et cetera. But I remember we got home and I just got in uh, a, a new apartment that I moved into in Oceanside. And um, my battalion XO calls us all back. He's like, hey, we're going back over. And it was, it had been a month since we got back. I said, sir, what are you talking about? And they're like, well, we're going to, we're invading Iraq and they want us on the front lines because we're the senior battalion. They went as part of RCT one for the for the big push up the up the gut, and so um, so we did we did the uh, the invasion, went back over did the invasion, um, and then after kind of you know mission accomplishment, um, they pulled us off the front lines at that point point uh, to be able to kind of retrofit and head back home, and it was on my way back that uh, finally got orders over to to take the NDOC. Um did the indoc when I when I got back and went through schools phase. Workup phase, green side, black side, and then um, took my platoon back over, doing um, kind of a lot of snatch and grab missions and some deep RNS stuff in uh, what was called North Babiel Province at the time. That's awesome. And so that was uh, 2004 or 2003. When you that were back? was 2000. That was 2004, five. Yeah, 2004 and five. Gotcha. And, was that and I ended up getting out late 2005, early 2006. Gotcha. Was that with BVK and Rudy? <laughs> so Rudy was at first recon battalion um, during while well, I was actually still at uh, I think at the time I was still at three one BVK was at three one with me uh, with Kilo Company and um, was still at three one when I was over at Force and he went I think he went to he went to recon, uh, first recon battalion first gotcha uh, while I was at, at first Force and then he en ended up making his way over there uh, after that nice. Uh, into into the Marsoc community, so yeah, awesome, yeah. That's one of the things for people listening the the recon and force recon community, and and not only did they provide the foundation for Marsoc, but it's incredibly small, tight knit community. So uh, the lineage is is really tight, and um, mm. there's a very strong brotherhood there, which is which is pretty cool. Absolutely. So yeah, that's awesome. So you did that, and then came back, got out. What what was the reason you wanted to get out, or what was in your mind at that time for you to move forward? Well, it, it had really been eating on me a lot. I, you know, I, I really, I really loved the community. You know, I loved the guys. I loved the community. I was, uh, you know, they had just stood up debt one. So there was a guy named Steve Fiscus, who was a buddy of mine who, who had uh, gone over there while I was 
deployed. He, he had gone over to, to stand up that one as the first uh, commander there. And a lot of the guys that I, I knew were going over to stand up that one. So I, I was thinking about rotating over to, uh, to debt one after I got back. And, and uh, I'd also been talking to the recruiters about CAG selection. I filled out an application for the, uh, the ground branch guys and they were, they had to give me an offer. So I was looking at doing a lot of different stuff like in our community. Right. But I'd had a couple experiences while I was in combat that really opened up my eyes to this disturbing connection just couldn't kind of wouldn't leave me. So I, I began to see, you know, we were out there doing these snatch grab missions all the time. Right. But the, the, um, the movement kept growing, whether it was Al Qaeda or insurgents or, um, and then later on down the road, even ISIS, they were, they were leveraging the desperation of extreme poverty to fuel the growth of a lot of what they were doing. And I know eventually like, like guys like you and BBK were even doing mission sets VSO to kind of try to address that. Right. But when we were out there, we, we were trained to have targets. We were not trying to train to help farmers, you know, increase crop yields and stuff like that. And, the aid groups couldn't reach these populations because it was too dangerous. And uh, so, so we thought there was a pretty critical gap in our national security strategy here because these, uh, these insurgents and these, these violent extremist groups, they were actually going out there and they were doing aid work. I mean, they were horribly oppressive, but in a vacuum, there was no other choices for these farmers. And so I had a couple pretty intense personal experiences with some of these poor farmers who really lost everything because they just had no choices. I, I, uh, uh, there was a one case where I saw, you know, when this sadly, uh, uh, one of these farmers got his whole family slaughtered right in front of me and we couldn't save him fast enough. Right. Because, because he was trying to escape that, that desperation. Um, and you know, when I had these experiences, it really kind of showed me that there, there was, there was a gap that guys like us could fill because the aid community, you know, has brilliant people, but they don't have the security background or the security professionalism on how to handle themselves sometimes in the more uh, chaotic, violent situations. And we thought, hey, what if you can make a hybrid? Like, what if we could take former operators like us, combine them with kind of frontline development professionals to form these composite teams that could embed in these highly fragile places where nobody else could go, right? And we could work with we could live there for five to seven years, right? And work with local leaders to build out locally led solutions to extreme poverty so that these folks have real choices, you know, and we could build what we call, you know, we could call resilience corridors to stop the spread of groups like Al Qaeda and ISIS. So we kind of hatched this idea and, you know, nobody seemed to be doing that stuff. And I thought, you know, if, if we could build out this kind of poverty eradication model in these places where nobody else could go, maybe we can really add some real value there to the overall national and global security strategy against these violent extremist organizations. And so it was that, it was that desperation and that lack of meaningful choices and this idea that really drove me into this new direction. And I really felt compelled and called to try to try to do something about that gap. And that led me eventually to transition out when my time was up uh, to try to figure out a way to, to build something to stand in that gap. And honestly, when I first got out, I hadn't planned on building anything. I was going to try to join one of these other organizations to try to like build that skill set as a, as kind of a uh, subunit of the organization, you know, where I could pull a bunch of our, our buddies out and we could form these t teams that could go in and do this work. But uh, nobody wanted to hire guys like us uh, back then. And so I kind of thought, you know, screw you guys. I'll, I'll go build my own thing. Yeah. Which, uh, was uh, easier said than done. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea how to build a company. I had no idea how to fight poverty. And, and uh, I had a real moment of crisis where I was, I was pretty despondent. Uh, you know, wasn't being hired. I'd left all my best friends, my brothers, right, from the community. Felt totally alone. Um, I remember going into the grocery store and seeing like 12 boxes of cereal thinking, this is the biggest choice I'm going to make today, right? Like, mm -hmm. and just, just really being frustrated about, about, you know, my decision and kind of at a loss, I, you know, a lot dealing with a lot of the stuff we deal with, you know, when you come home and, and, but I was determined to try to figure out a path. So I had to pay my rent. So I just took a one decision at a time. I got a job driving a seafood delivery truck um, in San Diego and in Orange County and LA had a route. And as I did that, I used that time to kind of build a business plan. 
And uh, then I applied to business schools. Uh, I applied to Stanford and Harvard because I heard they were good and um, by some miracle got in. I think they had a quota for West Virginia Marine or something. And, uh, and ended up going to Stanford. And it was really big enabling experience for what became New Roo International, this company that I started. And I, I went to business school with one goal, and that was to build that company. And, and so every class I took, um, I was running, you know, as you know the deal, like you run the business fundraising meetings in between classes, you're trying to raise money. And, and eventually we were able to raise about half a million dollars. So by the time I graduated in June of 08, I, I moved to really remote Africa where I lived in these villages for the next seven years, kind of building this thing out. It's so awesome. That's such an amazing story. And obviously it was challenging and difficult at that time, right? To be humbled again and, and have to take a job, you know, driving a delivery truck while you're figuring this out and, and figuring out how to pay. One rent. of the best jobs I ever had, by the way. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. 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 I, I don't, I don't mean it in that manner. Right. Like, but no, I know. Uh, I know. But as a period of transition, right, figuring out how to move forward with your life, um, it's an incredible story. And, uh, and then obviously the, nice, the wherewithal to not just make that decision to pursue it, but to have the determination and drive to continue to, to do that over such a long period of time and never quit, right? Um, it's very, very impressive. And then as, as, as well, during business school, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, hey, I want to start a business. Do I need to go back to business school? And the answer is, you know, Maybe, maybe not, right? It's, uh, it's a tool, it's not gonna teach you everything, but um, I had a similar experience as well, where when I was there, mm. the skills I was learning were new and tactical skills, whether it was in marketing or finance, and then I applied those directly to trying to build a business or prepare to build a business, like, you know, learn marketing during the day and then at night, like, trying to apply it direct hand. And so that's why I think I was able to maximize that. And it sounds like you were, you were very successful in doing so as well, so. That's awesome. Jake walked the walk and basically, you know, raised just enough money to go live in, in remote village in Africa for seven years, right? To, to run this and to, yeah. to execute and to lead from the front too, which is, is pretty noteworthy. And so, um, thanks brother. Yeah. And, and, and one other point too, I want to highlight as well is a lot of people may not understand, but probably anybody that's been in these combat zones, I would say that's engaged in the local populace whatsoever, especially with any sort of insurgent or combatant mm -hmm. um i don't know what the percentage would be but a large majority i would say are exactly what you just just described right they're not professional soldiers they're not professional terrorists mm -hmm. they're just people trying to put food on the plate for their family right and mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um the mission of nuru to to go forward and try to solve the root problem and the root cause of of what's getting what's creating the situation where that person wants to pick up a weapon and go try to kill mm -hmm. Americans um, is pretty, pretty incredible. Um, you know, and mm -hmm. for us, like we were, when we were doing village stability operations in Afghanistan, uh, everybody was growing poppy, right? And, you know, in the mm -hmm. past we'd had these eradication campaigns that didn't work because we weren't understanding the fundamentals of the situation where that's the only way they can make money for their family. And they've already mm -hmm. taken a loan because there's no finances, there's no loans, there's no banks. They've already taken out a micro loan from the Taliban. Mm -hmm. leveraging and mortgaging the poppy that's going to grow in that farm, right? So when we go out there yeah. and, you know, say drugs are bad and burn the field down, right? It doesn't solve the issue, right? It doesn't solve anybody's problem. Right. Um, right. And so it was pretty that's cool. Right. And, and it was also really cool too, as well, that the BVK brought you back in as a guest speaker for us. I remember that you were, you were there, right? Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, was awesome. That was the first time I think I met you. Uh, that's right, man. Which is I'll, awesome. I'll never forget that meeting. Yeah. There's a bunch of good guys in that room. Yeah, it was, uh, the two, that was a good group. It was awesome. Yeah. The two that, that he had us do was you. And then a guy named Barry Goodson who wrote the book cap Mo from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. both of those were really impressive and, and very helpful mm -hmm. and re relevant, right. For what we were about to do. So, mm -hmm. so that was awesome. Yeah. So, um, so you've done that and it's incredibly successful and, and then still decided to continue serving, right? So now you're serving in a different capacity with, a new organization you founded called more perfect union. Uh, and I'm really excited about this. So I'd love to just hear more and share for any listeners what it is and what you're yeah. doing. Well, I mean, uh, what ended up happening when I was uh, building new uh, really, really in spite of a lot of my flaws and weaknesses and mistakes I made as a leader 
And as a testament to my amazing team, we started having some pretty incredible success. We empowered over 130,000 people out of extreme poverty. We raised about $60 million to get us there. I had a global team of 200. So we started attracting some attention back in the U.S. And uh, in 2015, President Bush invited me back to participate in this new program they were doing called the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program. But to participate, I had to move back to the U.S. And I hadn't lived in the U.S. for like 15 years, man. I was always deployed as a Marine downrange. I lived in these villages for seven years. And I remember coming home in 2015, I was just shocked by what I saw. I did not recognize the country I left to fight for in 2000. You know, there's this bitter fear and hatred that seemed to be ripping the country apart. You had these two warring factions of political parties, um, you know, the Republican and Democratic Party that had extremism in both sides and they were destroying all value to the American citizen. And I, I was really sad, man. Like all of us had been downrange fighting to defend the, the idea of America and only to come home and realize it wasn't going to be ISIS or Al Qaeda that, that defeated us. It was going to be us. And then I got really pissed off and I thought, it doesn't matter how much great work we're doing downrange. If the light of American democracy goes out, like what's it all for? And so I tried to figure out like how I could get plugged in. What can I do? I had uh, some of my mentors ask me to run for office. I, I said, you know, that's not a good fit for me. I don't want to do that. And, uh, so over time, um, some of my backers, investors from Nuru, who have been backing me for about eight years, they eventually came and said, hey, look, we got kids, we're worried. This was in 2019. Things got worse and worse. And in 2019, when I was back from Nigeria, we had started a project in Northeast Nigeria. We were doing some work against ISIS and, and Boko Haram there. And I remember I came home and, and was visiting with them and they said, look, we got kids and we're really worried that they're not going to have a democracy to inherit, a country to inherit. We're shifting all of our philanthropy. We're trying to figure out a way to build a center in American politics. We're looking around. We don't see a lot of good options. Um, you know, we back to you as an outsider who disrupted the aid industry. Would you be willing as an outsider, again, to take a look at the politics industry and see is there a way to disrupt it to build out this center in politics to help heal the country? And if you can find a market gap, you know, then, then if you'll build and lead it, we'll back you. And so I spent about four months, nights and weekends kind of diving in to try to understand the market, you know, who's, who's doing what, what's working, what's not working, and why. And I began to see what I thought was real market gap. And so I put together a 60-page white paper. I sent that around to some of my mentors. I had you know, Jim Mattis and John Allen and President Bush, a few others, looked at it and encouraged me to, to do it. And so I um, put together a 12-month transition plan out of Nuru. And last June, I was able to hand off the range to the new CEO there. And, and, and they're thriving. I think they just had to get rid of me. And then in, uh, in July, I set up this new thing called More Perfect Union. And uh, I'll tell you really quickly what it is. It's a, it's a pretty crazy idea. It's, it's a big, risky thing. But we, we really think that you know, the crisis the country's in right now demands big thinking, big ideas. And so it's a 10-plus year strategy with multiple phases. The most important phase is our disruption phase in, the, in, the, in phase one, which is focused on 2022. Uh, two overarching goals for the phase. We want to help... Heal the divide in the country that's tearing, tearing Americans apart. And then two, uh, we want to build a center out in politics that makes the government work for the people. And so um, the way we're doing that, on the healing side, we're st we've started a veteran-led movement that will be the next generation of civic organization for the country. So think Rotary or Lions Club or, or, or Kiwanis Club. Those are all in decline, sadly. We need a next generation civic organization to inspire the, the, the next generation um, of young people, millennials, Gen Z, even our generation. And these veterans, their job is going to be to go out and to mobilize and catalyze folks from the left and right to come together with one purpose in these chapters, and that's community service projects. It's going to be all about community service, leadership training, and civics training. And so the goal is we get Americans back in the trenches together, get their hands dirty, break bread together, have tough conversations together, humanize the other side so we can rem remind ourselves what it means to be Americans, that there's so much... That, you know, uh, that unites us, you know, and, and our differences are actually our strengths. So that's the movement side. And then the political side of what we're doing is, is the more under the radar side, uh, side. I call it our insurgency strategy. So in 2022, we're trying to get uh, three to five country first candidates elected into the U.S. Senate to form a powerful fulcrum in the center. So these folks are going to run as Republicans and Democrats. But once they get in, they're going to vote together as a bloc to break the power of the majority and minority leader in the Senate and get real legislation moving through the Senate again for the American people to meet them where they're at, at the kitchen table to deliver solutions. Um, so the, the vision there is over time we can build out this center in the Senate 
so that we can uh, have a moderate faction form up on either side that is the basis for negotiation bipartisanship, getting real solutions through Congress. And if the parties refuse to reform, you'd actually have a viable base to form a third party eventually, but, but, but from within the system, from within the Senate, not trying to start from the outside. That's amazing. Truly amazing. Yeah, it's an incredible goal. And uh, I can't think of something that's more urgently needed within our own uh, democracy. Um, and so Thanks, brother. that's awesome. Uh, I know we're running short for time, so we'll cut it here. But uh, would love to bring you back on and chat more and learn more. But, uh, yeah. but one thing I would like to, to just point out, too, if you have a minute before you leave, is um, mm -hmm. how can people learn more about getting involved with More Perfect Union or donating time, talent, treasure? Uh, and are you publicizing these candidates so people can back them knowing that they're doing this? Or is this still you know, not public information. So this, for this first cycle in 2022, we're not publicizing the candidates right now. Um, but people can get involved in the movement. We're building a, a movement for all Americans right now. And they can go to mpu.us. And that's where they can find out a lot more about what we're doing as we build the movement. Um, mpu.us. That's awesome. Yeah. Amazing. Thanks, brother. Yeah, seriously. I can't think of anything more uh, noble and valuable to the next generation and a way to give back with lasting, lasting impact. So thank you, brother. Awesome. Well, excellent. Well, this has been an episode of forward. My name is Derek Carrera. I'm here with good friend, Jake Harriman of more perfect union You can go check out more and learn more about his, his movement that he's creating to help heal the divide in our nation at mpu.us. Thank you all for listening.